So um, my plan for today for class is uh, shaped a little bit by student needs for some of the projects. Specifically, there are some students who are um, looking at uh, projects which involve characterizing the flow of individuals among some processes. So these may be uh, processes associated with an institution, it may be processes associated with workflow, processing of claims, um, uh, the uh, sort of process someone might go through on a series of diagnoses um, in an, on an outpatient capacity, so they're not specifically in an institution, but they're being routed among different individuals. And um, it turns out that any logic has uh, a very uh, powerful and refined language for these uh, characterizing these sort of workflow process oriented situations. This falls under the normal uh, domain of what's called um, discrete event modeling. And what's powerful about any logics um, you know, implementation of it is, what's particularly powerful is that it uh, allows you to combine it, to hybridize it with classic stock and flow modeling and with agent based modeling. So um, what I'm going to be uh, doing today for the first part of, of uh, today's session will be giving an overview of uh, any logics uh, tools for building up discrete event models. We will subsequently have, um, it'll uh, be in a, in a separate session, a look at sort of how in concrete terms you make these, hybridize these with uh, agent-based models. I'll, I may say a few words about these. But fundamentally, we're going to be looking at uh, modeling of, of workflow and processes, typically in irregular geometries, like within a building. And uh, just as a, uh, by way of introduction for these things, um, uh, we early on in the class saw an example of a um, facility-based model where we had a hospital depicted, and the hospital included, we'll see down here in the lower left, a set of, of uh, rooms and a set of resources such as might be associated with uh, x-ray imaging or ultrasound or what have you, a waiting area, etc. This is an example of what I call irregular spatial embedding. You have people moving between rooms here within the, uh, within the facility. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now will be to go onto the Stellar site and to obtain a model that's listed there under the example models uh, that's called the ophthalmology department. Um, this is actually a model that was uh, provided as part of the sample models of uh, earlier versions of any logic and for whatever reason it's, it's not currently distributed as part of it so I'm only making it available to people in this class but you should be able to provide uh, to find a zip file on the Stellar site. And um, you should be able to download that and extract an ophthalmology ALP file, ophthalmology department ALP, which I'd like you to, um, to open. Okay, hi. Uh, Thank so, you so much for responding to my question. Oh, no, yeah. no problem. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit um, yeah. during break and after class. Yeah. Th that would be good. I thought I had an unexpected request yesterday that caught me up yesterday, but uh, today would be good to talk actually. Um, so uh, came in at, at just the right point. Um, so uh, what I was describing is today we're going to be looking, because of some student demands, at um, a uh, how any logic supports uh, process-oriented modeling, patient flow modeling. Um, because several student projects are seeking to combine this with agent-based modeling and uh, we'll be showing how that can be done. We've, uh, we've notably finished um, the portion of the class which, it was, which was spent on building up a vocabulary of agent-based modeling um, and uh, because we're, we're past the basics of that um, basics including state charts, uh, stocks and flows within agents, uh, parameters, variables, um, events, um, agent mobility,
spatial location, network location. Because we've, we've covered a lot of the basics there, increasingly what I'm going to be talking about in this class are any logics um, additional tools that apply to multiple types of modeling. Uh, for example, calibration. For example, um, uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, for example, intervention um, simulation. These apply whether you're building an any logic system dynamics model, a, an agent based model, or a, um, a discrete event model. Today, we're going to be looking at discrete event models, um, in part because they are featured in some student projects and because they mesh so well with the basics of what we've seen with agent based models. And there's a very nice way you can combine them. Um, so today we're going to have a sort of whirlwind look at support of, of uh, patient flow modeling, of, of modeling of, of uh, individuals flowing through processes. And to that end, I would like to ask people to go to the Stellar site for the course um, and download a model called ophthalmologydepartment.zip. Now, if anyone has problems, I could uh, distribute it to you on a thumb drive. But um, uh, otherwise, if you could do it, would you like that? Yeah, I can uh, open the file and download it. Okay, sure. So uh, what I'll do is uh, just put it onto here, and and we'll get it over to you. Does anyone else need this as well? So it's on the Stellar site, um, and uh, that's the course website. Um, and if you go there, you should see uh, a set of example models, and there should be one called ophthalmology um, uh, ophthalmology department .zip. Um, But I will provide this right now on this thumb drive. So if anyone w prefers that, um, I can give that to you. Okay. So this is down here and it's uh, ophthalmology department any logic 622 is what it's formally called okay so I've just copied it to this drive I will start to circulate this and if anyone's still having trouble uh, finding it so you got it okay there you go the, the main folder the, the root folder of the drive okay and uh, other people need it too No, it's it's actually it's actually a, a separate uh, file is uploaded there, um, and one of the reasons is because um, this is actually an AnyLogic created sample model that's no longer provided with the latest version of AnyLogic, so it's kind of different than the others in the sense that the others are uh, at least modified by me. Okay, so um, it's a zip file, and then you you, you need to. You need to open it, and you can grab out the ALP file from within it, um, as you would with other uh, zip files. Um, you can, you should be able to pull that out. Um, and uh, I'll be going through this on the screen too, so it's not a disaster if you don't have it. But it'll be helpful for, to sort of follow along. Um, so I was just mentioning if you could go to the website and download ophthalmology department. Dot, um, there's an ophthalmology department. Uh, it says AnyLogic 622.zip or something like that. It's also on that on there on the root folder. Yes, yeah, so maybe we'll just pass it around. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's the, the ophthalmology department. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. I'm going to start uh, along these lines, and if anyone is having um, enormous difficulty, uh, still in a few minutes, signal me, and I, I may do my rounds. Um, okay, uh, we'll do grand rounds. Um, uh, okay, so uh, today we're talking about uh, discrete event modeling um, with an eye towards, uh, in a subsequent um, subsequent lecture, really highlighting how it's combined with agent-based modeling. I'll, I'll mention a few essentials about that today. So this is resource-based modeling, process-oriented modeling, and it will involve a lot of queue, representing queues, processes, flow charts of, of various workflow processes, um, pools of, of resources, and visual movement um, of, of entities and resources with those entities. Um, 
So there's a few central concepts in this um, that we're going to see in the various examples we take a look at in today's session. Um, and I want to highlight these up front because you'll see them recurring again and again. And really, this is the conceptual heart of it. We'll see how any logic actually implements this. But fundamentally, what we have is we're going to have models where entities are going to flow through a series of processes, not necessarily linear. The processes may have branches associated with them. They may have loops associated with them. So conditional statements, um, rejoins of, of branches uh, for, for subsequent processing that's the same among all entities. But entities are going to be flowing through here, through these processes, and they're being processed at successive stages. Um, and flow charts are going to specify these processes. They're going to specify this sort of workflow of sorts. And as you'll see, any logic has a quite articulated language for describing these flow charts. And we're going to see the different pieces that make it up. Those pieces, to understand them, we're going to be emphasizing certain concepts, uh, particularly around resources and entities. And so it's important to pay attention to understand how these things work. It's kind of intermediate between building things up out of stocks and flows, where you have just two, a couple sorts of pieces, stocks, flows, you could argue auxiliary variables, um, uh, versus agent-based modeling, where you have lots and lots of different types of pieces. Here you have a modest number of pieces and some core concepts. So agents will be flowing among these different processes, and those, there's going to be resources required for different sub-pieces of that process. And when those resources sources are available, an agent's <laughs> going to seize them and use them. An example might be they'll seize a, a room in which to, to meet with a doctor. Or they'll, they'll uh, seize a, a piece of diagnostic equipment that will be used to diagnose them. In a way that, that sounds dangerous, but actually has well-defined meaning, they may seize another resource, like they may seize a clinician. And that clinician will then accompany them um, after being attached to them, will accompany them around the facility. So resources of various sorts will exist. Pools of resources that are considered more or less interchangeable. Say a pool of clinicians, a pool of, of um, uh, scopes to examine a patient, a pool of x-ray machines, a pool of rooms. And agents will try to seize these and, and use them. Where there's not enough available, they'll in queue, they'll wait. They'll be in a queue awaiting this resource. And often these resources are capacity limited. There's only so many rooms in, the in, in which the individuals can meet. There's so many, only so many pieces of equipment, like x-ray equipment or an MRI for the, to be used on patients. So there's queues. These entities um, will eventually release these resources when they're done and be free and uh, eventually depart from the system. As we'll see, I'm going to be describing the logic of it first, and as we'll see, there's a whole visual component to it too, which is actually very, very elegant and mirrors or parallels the, um, the, the logical component. So specifically, there will be homes of sorts for resources. So clinicians will have a place that they go um, when they're not, um, they're not being occupied with a patient. Nurses will have a place. Um, X-ray machines may have a physical fixed location. Uh, portable scopes used for ophthalmology may be carried and stored in a storage room. These are physical homes, and um, they'll have a, a visual representation that um, will uh, be, you'll see visually when you're running these models. And finally, there's movement paths um, via, um, actually, let's just say polylines, not polygons, that are used, well, there's polygons um, that are also used in a separate context, but there's polylines which are used to delineate movement paths, okay? So what we're going to see is a very visual depiction of agent movement and flow among various paths, and we'll come to that. Okay, so one of the first concepts to, um, uh, to appeal to here is that 
We're going to have a, um, a concept known as network. And in fact, agent, um, any logic terms this sort of modeling. You could call it patient flow modeling, you could call it discrete event simulation. Um, they call it network based modeling. And they have a concept of a network which, which groups together um, some entities are within that network, resources associated with the network. There might be a couple types, a couple pools of resources, and certain types of portions of the overall workflow. Um, so a, a network would re represent sort of a clustered group of resources that are used for uh, addressing certain processes. So it might be a ward, for example, in a hospital is associated with a network. Um, or a certain subcomponent of the workflow associated with an HMO might, might have a, um, a network associated with it. Um, a certain common pool of resources of one or more types, um, a certain set of processes associated with those resources, etc. So what I'd like you to do is to open up um, that ophthalmology example, and I've passed it around. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, oh, excuse me. Okay, so um, when you said we described earlier, okay. I was thinking about like when you and I talked. No, no, no. You mean the, the yeah, earlier the discussion network. like of scale-free yeah, networks, of uh, Poisson random graphs, of, of um, a small world. Right. No, no, it's a different network. It's a different network. Okay, okay. And, and that's important because any logic supports both. And this is a, a network having to do with uh, processes and, uh, and somewhat confusingly, there's also a visual network over which people move around, and, and you can see these so-called polylines. And th that would be analogous to like scale-free kind of, but it's not the scale-free model I know, but okay. it's like a physical. Right. Computer. Correct. Correct. So, so this these sort of physical movement paths have our geometric entities as compared to like a scale-free network, which is right, right. not necessarily geometric. I mean, it, it is in like a network of agents. Yeah, that's true. No, I mean, these, these are, it's actually, this is a network linking up spaces, right? And, 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 and it dictates sort of how can you get from space A to space B. Okay. Yeah. Um, and entities flow over that. Entities move over that. Resources move over that. Okay. Um, good, good questions. Let's, um, it may help to see some examples and then, and then I can explain it more. So I, I passed around a thumb drive, and it should be making its round. Um, so what I'd like you to get out of there is a thing called ophthalmologydepartment.zip, something along those lines. Ophthalmology department, any logic 622.zip or something. Um, uh, six under, underscore two two. Um, right. Um, and uh, I'd like you to, to to extract from that any lo uh, the ophthalmology example or the ophthalmology department on ALP and open it up. And specifically, I'd like you to open up main phase one. So, so this um, model is going to have, uh, has, has a set of, interestingly, something you've not seen before, I think, multiple main classes. Okay. And there's no environment. Sorry? And there's no environment. There's no environment that's uh, directly used by this. There's multiple main classes. Okay. And the reason is, though, at no point are these main classes running at the same time. Only one of them ever runs at the same time. This is used purely for didactic purposes to kind of show how you build up a model like this. Okay? It's shown, how it, it helps us understand how a model is built up out of pieces in successfully more complex fashion. So within this, um, within this presentation, <laughs> what I'm going to be doing is highlighting the different pieces that make these up. And then we're going to go through, a, in a staged way, the different levels of the, of the modeling so that you can kind of see how these pieces fit together, first in a simpler way and then a more complex way until you arrive at a, a, a model that's reasonably complicated. Okay, um, Okay. so I'd like you to open up main phase, main phase one. And you should see something like this, okay? And I just want to orient you towards a couple things on the screen because we're going to spend a lot of time in, in this um, in this diagram. So the first thing is down here in the red on the lower right, you notice there's a thing that says network, okay? Um, and it looks a little bit like the networks we've been seeing before. You know, 
Um, but this is actually a logical network speci specifying a set of group resources, and it's going to be associated with a certain portion of this diagram you see up above. So this network below is associated, you'll see, with doctor, proc room, procedure room, and scope. Okay? Um, those are actually pools of resources, and hence they're being shown in kind of a bathtub-like way with some uh, some uh, blue, blue substance, um, which is water. Um, so it's a pool. It's a pool of resources. And what I mean by that is that there's a set of doctors um, that are considered, for the purposes of this modeling, more or less interchangeable. Um, there's a set of procedure rooms, which are considered more or less interchangeable in the sense that None of them is particularly privileged. If there's a patient who comes in, they can be routed to any one of them, whatever's free, right? And similarly, there's, there's a set of, of ophthalmology examination scopes, um, uh, which are used to examine patients, and those are considered interchangeable as well, okay? And so this network down here groups together these things, and then there's a, you'll notice there's kind of a, a flow chart up above of sorts which is associated with um, portions of which are associated with this network. And that's going to define these processes. How does an agent flow through if they come in? It tells a story of sorts. It tells a narrative. They come in, they go through some set of processes which involve a procedure and it's kind of hard, and then they flow out. Okay? So it's describing their, the story of their encounter with this, with this network. Okay? Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the concepts and, and then we're going to dive into this model and really start to see the pieces out of which you build it and then how it works in detail when you put those pieces together. Okay, so the, the first concept I want to draw on here is, is entities. So entities within this sort of modeling are the central parties on which processes take place. And they're, they're fairly passive in its traditional depiction. They flow through a set of processes and things happen to them. Okay, So uh, patients, for example, might flow through a hospital. They're routed from the triage nurse to the emergency room bed. They're seen by a doctor. The doctor examines them. They send them to an x-ray machine. The doctor, uh, Im a, do a radiologist, images, uh, images them there and uh, they get routed back to the emergency room and they wait and so they're, they're viewed as somewhat uh, passively flowing through the set of processes. Um, similarly, you might imagine cars being assembled in an assembly line. Um, it may pass from one <laughs> station to the next, and they're being assembled successively, um, but they're moving through this series of processes. Okay? Um, so these <coughs> entities are flowing through this, through this flowchart this workflow, as it were, that specifies the set of stages of, of processing they go through. And different entities may go in different directions on this workflow. But um, there's a term that they're injected into the system at a source and they disappear at a sink. Okay, so they come in at some beginning and they disappear at the end. And they only exist, the entities only exist in the sort of model for the duration of time that they're in the system, which is typically some sort of uh, fairly well delineated time according to those processes. So they appear and they disappear at the end. Now, when we combine this with agent-based modeling, we're going we're gonna to break down that view, okay? We're going to break it down by having agents persistently associated with these, uh, persistent um, with these entities. An entity will be associated with a particular agent, and that agent will outlive that entity's sort of flowing through the system. They'll stick around, they'll remember, or they'll be affected by that engagement with the set of processes, and they may reappear uh, in the, at the source again for further processing in the future. Um, but for right now, these entities are transient. They come about, they flow through, and they depart. Okay? Um, there is a uh, uh, thumb drive. Is it still going around here? Okay. Um, okay, great. Great. Um, Hey, terrific. Uh, appreciate someone putting that in. So maybe you want to pass it um, down here um, and uh, see if you can get out off that zip file because it will be important for our discussion. 
Okay, so typically multiple entities are in the system at any one time. Okay. There may be multiple entities at the same point in the system or at different points in the system. One person may be uh, visiting the triage nurse, just having come in on a gurney from an <coughs> automobile accident. Someone else is waiting in anaphylactic shock in the, in the emergency room. Someone else is being uh, diagnosed by the x-ray machine, or two people may be being diagnosed by the x-ray machine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So what we're talking about here is discrete event modeling. And I wanted to uh, emphasize that the core concept um, of relevance there is, is entity, okay? These entities that flow through the system. Um, typically that's done in a way that's uh, independent from, that's a, a sort of a solitude compared to the solitude of, of, of the agent-based model. They're, they're not normally combined. Um, however, both of them are at an individual level, right? Um, so you have agents who are typically articulated at the, say, the level of a person, and you have entities, as might be in a hospital, say, that are typically people as well. And the fact that both of them describe individuals gives you an opportunity in a tool like AnyLogic, which has this great flexibility to combine different sorts of modeling, to actually associate them. So. The, an important salient motivation for this, not the only motivation, but an important one, is to, <coughs> is to go beyond the kind of transient nature of entities typically. The, the fact that they kind of appear at this point, they flow through and they disappear at that point. And instead, and by contrast, you have agents which typically you know, will live for some long duration of time, perhaps associated with their lifetime or what have you. And what I'm saying is you can, in fact, hybridize the two. So you have an entity um, being the kind of representation, as it were, of an agent while in a facility, but the agent outlives that entity. <coughs> the entity will disappear at the end. The agent will persist. So just to get it, to yeah. to yeah. you say then that in discrete modeling, the intelligence yeah. is in the process itself, whereas an agent-based intelligence or the yeah. Yeah, you can say that. I mean, again, entities, traditionally in this sort of modeling, entities are simpler, fairly passive things. And, and the, the intelligence or a lot of the structure of it is, is characterized in, the, in, in, in describing that, those processes that operate on the, on the entities, right? And, and meanwhile, in agent-based modeling, we have very much a situation where the focus of attention, the focus of, of, of structure, and, um, and the, uh, the sort of specification is really focused around the, ent about the agents okay. themselves. Okay. And, and w another motivation besides the, the long persistence of agents, the fact that you know, they may have several encounters with, a, with the healthcare system, say, with a, with a hospital, and out of each one have some um, resulting uh, change. Maybe it's an improvement in their, their physical status. Maybe it's uh, a dislike of the, the healthcare system and alienation from it. Um, the fact that we can have those agents persistent over a long period of time is one attraction to hybridize. There's another attraction, though, which is that agents can more readily evolve um, over time in a sort of full-bodied way. And so if you have them associated with entities, instead of entities being purely passive and kind of having only very simple things typically done to them, you could actually have agents communicating behind the scenes, as it were, making phone calls from the ward, you know, having their health status evolve, transmitting infection to other people within the ward. And that's, that's atypical. I'm not saying it's, it's not permitted, but it's atypical in traditional discrete event modeling. And it's really, um, it, the fact that any logic supports both of these as first class modeling approaches allows you to combine the two in a way that takes advantage of the best features of both, right? And it allows you to describe the richness of, of the processes using discrete event modeling to route the agents phys, um, visually around in these irregular geometries like these, um, you know, these, uh, this sort of situation in a, in a facility. Um, that's very nicely done. It's very, very well specified, very concisely specified in a discrete event context in, in this sort of modeling we're looking at today. By contrast, 
um, uh, the the agent based tools of any logic allow us to 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 describe agent behavior and evolution in a in a in a concise and, and rich way. And really, we're talking when we're talking about hybridizing, we're talking about taking advantage of each for its own domain of richness, each for its own strength. Um, and, and playing to the strength of each, as it were, in a way that, that gives you the benefits of each um, with, with fewer shortcomings than if you tried to do everything purely in agent based or everything purely in, in, in discrete math model. So, okay. what are the different ways you could hybridize? So, so there were things about it yeah. where you had, um, so like just like you said, um, very direct, so you have a and then if you flow into the system, and it kind of falls into a network interaction. Yeah. And then continues in the discrete system. Is that well, it's okay, so um, I don't want to go into it too much right here because okay. first I want to let people see what is, uh, to, to see sort of what the character of, of discrete event modeling is. I know you're, you're very familiar okay. with it, and so I just want to make sure people are on the same page. But suffice it to say that um, it's not a matter of um, that you have to switch from one to the other. Both can be levels of description of the same situation, and both can be going on in parallel. So in other words, that agent can be richly embedded in a network of social connections while being at the same time, um, you know, sitting with a broken arm being imaged in an x-ray machine. and. Um, and it allows you to describe both of those at the same time and for the both to proceed at the same time. Um, so the agent's uh, health status is evolving while they're awaiting the care of a doctor in a queue, you know, waiting for the radiologist to come in, their compound fracture is worsening or whatever. Um, so, uh, so it's not a, an either or thing. In fact, it, it's both, both are a level of description of the same situation just from a different perspective. I think that's how it can be done. Okay. So um, uh, here we have typically multiple entities in the same time. So we have this, this sort of uh, flow chart, this, uh, this uh, workflow, as it were. But it's important to emphasize that um, uh, several entities may be there in, you know, each on a different bed in the, way in the emergency room waiting care, right? Um, several entities may be in the, in the intake room of the hospital awaiting attention of the triage nurse up here. Um, so we're gonna have we're gonna have queues and, and often there'll be multiple entities within a given queue. Um, and uh, we'll see that entities are often associated with a physical a visual representation as well that's gonna travel around. And in a more advanced thing that we'll be we'll be emphasizing um, in a separate lecture, you could do what's called subclassing of entities, which is basically a way to specialize entities. Um, so that you can have entities with richer properties than your typical entity. Okay? Um, so I've talked about entities. Entities are these, these um, individuals, as it were, uh, that, that flow through the system. They get operated on by the processes. They are tr they're a little bit more passive in the sense they're flowing through and being treated by these processes in various ways. Um, and they will queue up when they can't get access to, um, to resources. Now, resources are therefore also central to it, to the sort of modeling. Frequently, resources are required to initiate a particular phase of the processing. A particular stage of, their, of the workflow might require access to a resource. So when I come in, I'm awaiting in a group of people, I'm standing in line for a triage nurse. That's a r the, the nurse is a resource with respect to me as an entity. I'm awaiting at care. So once I see her, I may be put in the waiting room for, or say on a bed. And maybe there's no beds free, and so they're going to temporarily have me sitting in a wheelchair until they can move me to a bed. So I'm waiting a bed. That's a resource. A doctor may eventually, a clinician may eventually come around. Maybe it's a resident. And I'm awaiting that resident. That's a resource that's going to be looking at me as an entity. So. Each of these are resources uh, from the point of view of this model. The patient is flowing through the system, and resources like doctors, beds, um, diagnostic equipment, etc., are being used to, to process this, 
this entity. Um, so any logic is going to make some important salient distinctions between these sorts of resources. And um, you have a distinction as to whether they are portable or fixed in location. So an example of a fixed resource would be an MRI machine, traditional um, you know, CAT scanners or um, uh, uh, ultrasound, uh, bigger <coughs> ultrasound machines perhaps. Um, some resources might be portable. I think there's, there's uh, portable ultrasound machines, probably portable x-rays now. Um, uh, so there's some types of things that are portable. You can carry it around. Fixed ones, the patient's got to go there. To be, they've got to go to the location of the MRI. You're not going to have a portable MRI for a long time. Um, but you might have portable things to be brought to the patient. And hence, hence this distinction. Another, another um, distinction is uh, a third type is mobile, or, or as, as it calls it, somewhat confusingly, moving resources. So a moving resource would be a nurse or a doctor, clinician of various sorts, uh, physiotherapist. Um, you know, if you had a facility with security concerns, maybe it would be a guard dog or something like that. It moves around. Um, so resources that, that have agency, that can move around the by themselves without being carried. Okay? This is a, another type of resource. So there are these three types of resources that any logic supports. Okay? Um, and um, we will see that uh, the capture dependencies of processes on resources, typically a network, will be associated with multiple types of resources. So this network here that we've seen is associated with doctors, procedure rooms, and scopes for diagnosis, okay? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, they, they can actually move from uh, location to location. Okay. And they'll move continuously in this sort of space that y you see is kind of a blueprint up there. They'll, they'll move along these paths specifically. That's why those paths are there, okay? Um, okay, so I'd like you to go to main phase, um, okay, this is actually main phase two that happens to be open here, but I think you can do it in main phase one because I, I don't think they've changed those things between the phases. If we go to main phase one, um, and you scroll down to the bottom here, um, uh, what you'll see, for example, is, and I'll, I'll sort of bring it down, there are these several types of, of resources there. Um, and if you click on doctor, for example, you'll see the doctors are moving resources, okay? Um, there's several things to find for them. Um, first of all, as to the, the type, so moving, static, or portable static being fixed. Um, a second thing is the capacity of the pool. How many of those resources are there? So here there are five doctors. And again, they're considered interchangeable, hence it's being known as a pool. So notice this says network resource pool. And this network resource pool, like these others, are associated with the network called network. So this capacity is five. There's five of them, okay? And then they have a speed, speed of 10. So they, that measures the number of, of sort of units per, per distance. Um, I think it may be pixels per second or something like that that they can move around. And actually, more than that, it um, it says how to how to sort of create a new one, and that's that's boilerplate that's put in there. In fact, I think all these things it, it fills in some some default values. Okay, so so you have a. Um, uh, here are some specifications of what doctors are like as a resource. And the most critical thing is they're moving. They have a certain number of them um, and a certain speed. Okay? Um, obviously, if you didn't choose moving, they wouldn't have a speed associated with them. Okay. They say that the new resource you need to know a couple others, they get the speed, which is dynamic. Yeah. Um, sorry? just means um, I think it gets um, you, you can you can have it um, be different things it's not a fixed thing you can have it be a, an expression and the expression gets evaluated over time every time it's used it may use a different 
uh, for example, it may create an, a different one, and that's what that is, is doing. Or it may call a method and get back something else you know, uh, each time. Okay, so we're going to have flow charts, and I think um, I asked you to click on this first one, and you're seeing actually a small first, uh, flow chart there, this main phase one. We're going to be going through this in detail um, uh, later on. But you'll notice there's a couple features. One is there's a source, there's a sync, and then there's some intermediate steps. And you'll notice there's kind of a, a set of patterns associated with them. And these patterns you'll notice recurring, like this move to proc or move to exit, share the same pattern. And that pattern indicates the, the semantics of, of it. So that's a move to, a network move to operator. Okay? And we're going to talk through the major operators. In the, in, in the next few minutes, okay? Now, flowcharts can be more complex than this. The one we're looking at here is linear, but they can be nonlinear. You can have branches, you can have joins, you can have loops, etc. So, you can imagine a situation where um, perhaps you're imaged in a, in a diagnostic machine and the image is blurry, so they have to have you go in there again or something along those lines. So, you might have a loop you know, until an adequate image is, is aligned. Or you might have um, surgery, um, you know, uh, and in the surgery it could be unsuccessful. Maybe they leave a sponge in your wound or something and they have to reopen you. Um, uh, so you can have branches, joins, uh, and you notice this is a join, for example, where regardless of whether you came this way or you came this way, you flow down this way subsequently, okay? Um, uh, and we're going to see from the palette over on the right hand side, there's this thing that says something like enterprise library. We're going to see where we can draw these elements from where we can draw these elements here to build up these, these paths, okay? Build up these, um, these workflow specifications, build up these, these uh, flow, flow charts as I call them. So we're going to go through some major operators here, okay? We're going to go through these pieces out of which you build up these flow charts because those flowcharts describe the processes that are operating on these entities. And just like that was said earlier, a lot of the complexity, the regularities being captured are regularities in this process. So there's a little language for describing this. And um, it's not too complex if you understand the basic concepts of entities and resources and some basic rules that I'll be emphasizing. Okay, so um, we're gonna start with the source. So let's go, um, let's open up, this is main phase three, so I'd like you to open up. By the way, each of these main phases, as I say, is a main class. It's just, we have alternative main classes so you can see how the model would run with different main classes. That's what these are doing here. They're not running at the same time, they're just alternative descriptions of successively richer projects, okay? So if you, if you scroll up here, what you'll see is that there's a, sort of multi-phase thing here. And if you click on source here, um, what you should see down in your properties window is something like this. So um, this is a source. It's a source of entities, okay? And you have to specify certain types of information for each of these. Um, typically it's just one, two, or three things you have to fill in. Okay, um, this is asking, okay, how many entities per arrival? So, sort of, do entities come in bunches, in clumps, or just one at a time? Um, you have to fill something in there, and I believe that's a general expression, so it could be a <laughs> random distribution that's different each time. Uh, and then it says arri uh, arrivals defined by, how, how do you know when things arrive? Is there a fixed inter-arrival time? Is there, a, is there a certain rate or a variable inter-arrival time? Is there a table of some sort that specifies this, or is it manual? Do you sort of just call and say, inject this person into this network? And you might do that in a hybrid scheme with agent-based modeling, where someone gets sick in the population and they want to present for care, you say, inject me into the hospital, and it injects them. Okay, so here we chose it's a rate, and it's an arrival rate of point zero point five. So. On average, someone will arrive every 20 time units. On average. Yeah. In the inject method is where you could you know, specify your distribution. For the inject? Yeah. 
Yeah, you could certainly do that, but you can also do it, I believe, like, um, <coughs> The, the inter-arrival time would allow you to specify distribution of inter-arrival times. Um, the uh, arrival table would be, uh, I think that may be a distribution-based thing as well. Okay. Um, so inject, though, is, is the most general of all. Um, you can sort of arbitrarily inject people into this, uh, to this network at times of your choosing. Okay, so that's source. If you go click on sync, that's the end one. That's so, uh, so agents originate at the sources, they, they cease to exist, they go out of existence at the sinks. And really there's not much to be specified uh, typically for sinks. You'll notice there's this thing that says on enter with a D next to it that basically you can have something happen when somebody enters here, you could have a print a message, you could have it stored to a database or whatever. Here we're just leaving that blank. But basically this is going to Eliminate any entity once they reach if they reach here, they're going to they move, go out of existence as an entity. Okay, um, so that's the that's the sync. Um, now, in addition to coming in, so coming into this flow chart is we saw the job of source. That's when entities come in, but these entities may be routed among multiple so-called logical networks, like maybe among wards in a hospital, different wards in a hospital. Maybe there's a psychiatric ward. Maybe there's a ward ward for, you know, um, for uh, acute uh, cardiac care. Maybe there's wards associated with uh, uh, OBGYN, and um, and a given entity might flow among several of these. So they're first in one ward, and then they're in another. And network is what defines the resources for a given one of these. So. Um, Sinks, uh, sources and sinks have to do with creating an entity and disappearing them. But there's also you enter a network, a particular network. Now in this model, it's a, it may be a little bit confusing because there's only one network. But in general, you have to realize there may be more than one network. You may come into one network. In one case, you're routed by the triage nurse, whether you go to the intensive care unit or to the emergency room or whether you go to some other you know, uh, quarantine station for infectious disease or what have you. So here we have a network enter, and that's, that's associating you with this particular network. And if you go look at it, it says, what's the name of the network? It's network. That's that network we saw down there that's associated with three types of things, docs, procedure rooms, and scopes. Okay. So here there's only one network, so it seems obvious. But in general, there may be a couple networks. Um, uh, OK, so this, this says basically, OK, you're entering this world now. When you're entering this, you're entering the network world, and that means there's sets of resources at your disposal, right? Um, and for that network, this is important, you have a certain entry node, which is a waiting call, which is located in this diagram. Now, I'm going to, for now, gloss over this point. We're going to come back to it in maybe half an hour from now in a big way about sort of how this all relates to this visual representation. I don't want to get you distracted by details of visual representation while we're talking about the core concepts, the core sort of semantics, the meaning of, of how these things work logically. The, the visual thing is, is great and it accompanies it in a very elegant way, but we're going to come back to it later. Suffice it to say that when you enter this network, you appear at a certain place in the diet. And that's defined by one of these rectangles up here, this, this guy here, I believe. Um, and then you have a speed in this network, okay? So just as the resources like docs had speeds, when you enter this network, you're given a certain speed. And your speed here is the same as the doc speed. Um, the doc is, has the same speed as the patients um, in it. Okay. Um, Mind you, this could be an expression. Like maybe you'd have two types of speed, one for patients who are on wheelchairs and one for patients who are walking. And you could have this, instead of being 10, it could be, you know, it could be something which picks between random true point to, uh, point 0.2. And so if with 20% probability you're in a wheelchair, in which case your speed might be half of what it normally is or what have you. OK, um, so there's a network enter. Okay, and that informs this newly created entity of the available resources in this network and a network exit, and that's at the end. So before we saw source sync, which are at the beginning and end of the whole thing. They, they create and destroy these entities. Now we look at network enter, network exit. 
both of those kind of bracket the real work that gets done. Okay, so now we're going to go through a set of, of, of operators that are associated with the work. One thing is, and it's not in this model, but I just want to talk about it, is there's a split operator, which allows, I shouldn't say split, it, it allows you to go either one way or the other way. Okay. Um, so based on a certain situation, like maybe based on your output result from a test, or based on your past history, you're routed either one way or a subsequent way. This diagram we're working with is purposefully simple, so you don't see this, but suffice it to say it's a very simple thing. So you have this operator here, um, and it's again available over on the palette there, um, and it's called a select output one. And basically, um, uh, you can specify, okay, how do you determine whether or not you go out the true? So each of these branches, one is a T and one is an F. True, false, okay? And basically this is saying, okay, you go out the true if, and you can specify, okay, with a, is it with a certain probability? You have a certain chance of going out? Or is it if a certain condition is true, like you have some particular history, you have certain characteristics as a patient, maybe it's if you're in a wheelchair, they have to take you, you know, a different route in the hospital or whatever. And so here you <coughs> can specify, okay, under what conditions would someone go this way versus versus that way? Um, and again, you can specify some code if you want to to do custom things when you come in here. So this is select output. It's not not in your model. One thing that is in your model is the so-called delay. So right in the center of any one of these is a thing called procedure. And um, that's a grand name for it and so on, but really what it comes down to is it's, it's, it's a delay, okay? You can see it's, it's represented as a delay. And in this case, the delay is, has a time associated with it that's not fixed. It's drawn from a uniform distribution between zero and 10 is what they have it. And it also, you'll notice, has a capacity of five. That means there's, there's only, so many people that can be queued up here kind of awaiting this, um, uh, or in this procedure, I, I guess I should say, or are currently undergoing this procedure at the same time. And if there's more than that, well, uh, things, uh, it, it'll sort of run out of space for them. And um, you can see that you can override that and have a maximum capacity. You just have as many as possible. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on now, so those are a couple of these, the source, sync, network, enter, um, select, output, and delay. Split, I'm not talking about. Basically with split, you can have a given entity, now this sounds ghostly, but you can have an entity turn into two entities and flow down two parallel procedures. And those might represent like if they're being, like maybe someone is having their blood examined in the lab while they're undergoing radiological testing. Or maybe, you know, they're hitched up, they're being hitched up to certain types of um, support equipment at the same time something else is occurring with them. So they're conceptually both are occurring um, simultaneously. And then they'll probably merge together back later. What I'm now going to talk about though is, is a set of things that are somewhat more um, difficult to to appreciate, but I'll, I'll try to do my best to relate them to resources. They all have to do with resources. So I've mentioned we have these entities. They're flowing through, and sometimes resources are needed for tasks. So to be admitted, the triage nurse has to see you. To, to stay in a bed in the, in the ER room, a bed has to be available. To uh, be imaged, an x-ray room, uh, an x-ray uh, imager has to be free for use, etc. So those are resources, and how do these entities interact with these resources? How does an entity claim or reserve an, a resource? And how do they go to the resource? How do resources like doctors accompany the patient, et cetera? That's what we're going to be talking about now. Okay, so I, I did this. Let's, let's talk about resources. Okay, so, so we, we talked about these types of resources. Um, an agent will try to obtain a resource, and we use the term seize a resource. Um, and if they can't, they're in queue. They're, they're waiting, okay? So these resources live in pools of interchangeable resource units. A seize resource.
resource comes from the pool, a released resource returns to the pool, and um, and these uh, agents will try to seize resources to be able to undergo some procedure, for example. Um, and suffice it to say that like, if you have clinicians who differ in some respects, like maybe a patient always gets paired up with the same clinician, you, the way you do that is by representing them in different pools. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's let's look at, at our model here, and I'd like you to go to main phase. If you could just go to main phase two, just so you stay consistent with the um, the model. You'll notice main phase one, two, and three all have some similarity, like the similar diagram, some components, but they're they're getting successively more features as you go one, two, three. Okay, so I'd like you to click on. So you should see something like this in front of you. Okay, um, so. There's a couple of things here to draw your attention to. We, we said already that the network is associated with, with resource pools. However, there's further a thing called network C's and release that are here. And C's is going to will seek to achieve exclusive association of an entity with a resource. Basically, the, the, the entity will try to reserve a resource. Okay, so. This entity coming in here wants to go to a procedure room. It needs to go to a procedure room to be examined, let's say. To be examined in this procedure. In order to do so, that entity needs to reserve one of those rooms. So you don't have multiple entities going to the same room. You know, you don't have multiple entities in the same procedure room, which is not going to happen. And that with without capturing this mutual exclusion, you're going to be missing some of the aspects of congestion in hospitals, why there's people waiting in hospitals. So before the person moves to the procedure room, they're going to try to reserve that resource. Okay? Um, and then later, they're going to release it after the procedure. They don't need that room. They're going to leave that room, and they're going to release it for use by other patients. Okay? So seizing and releasing conceptually is how an agent is going to uniquely reserve a certain resource, okay? And what we'll see is that those are the first two of a number of different kind of uh, verbs, as it were, that we use in this to describe people's relationship with resources. These are probably the most important two because they have to do with uniquely reserving a resource, okay, on the part of an entity. We're going to see there's other components having to do with having uh, moving with the entities and so on. But seizing and releasing is, is all about reserving these entities. Okay? There's a separate distinction from seizing and releasing that have to do with attaching and detaching. Seizing and releasing have to do with unique reserve, unique, uniquely reserving a resource, uniquely being associated with a resource for some period of time. Attaching, detaching is all about will, will things spatially follow the agent. Things that have already been seized by the agent, will they, will they then follow the agent physically as they move through the system? As they move through these paths within the system, will the resources follow them or not? For example, you might seize a doctor. This sounds transgressive, but put aside the sort of meaning of it. So you might seize a doctor as an entity and um, that doctor is then uniquely reserved by you. They're associated with you uniquely for this period of time. And as you are routed among the facility, that doctor might travel with you. Uh, you are not attached to something, but you can be sent to a place. Okay, And we'll see how that, that gets done. Um, but but even when that occurs, like you might be sent to where the doctor's home office is, for example, and the doctor will go with you because they're they're attached to you. Okay. Yeah. So seizing has to do with logical association with reserving them uniquely. So there might be a doctor who's sitting in their office elsewhere, and they're seized by you in the sense that they're dealing with your case, but they're not physically with you, right? Similarly, there might be a procedure room that you've seized. It's booked in your name, but you're not there yet. Okay. Attaching has to do with that you physically stay with that thing. And this is for 
non-static things. So in other words, non-fixed things. Things that are either mobile, like doctors that move with you, nurses that move with you, um, or, or portable, a scope, a, um, you know, a portable ultrasound machine that, that travels with you, a wheelchair. It travels with you wherever you go, whither thou goest. Yes? So, why, why is the distinction necessary? Because you could, let's say there was a machine that was following you physically. Mm. You could always save that machine at some point and release it and on the phone. Yes, you could. So uh, okay, so there's a distinction because there are all four, well, okay, all, at least three possibilities are, are possible. So. You can imagine a case where I've seized something, but I don't want it physically to be with me. For example, I'm associated with a scope has been reserved to my name, or a room has been reserved to my name, but I'm not yet there physically, right? Okay. A doctor has been reserved to work on my case, but they're still in their office. However, there's other cases where I do want to say, okay, this doc is following me around wherever I go. This nurse is following me. This scope is following me. It's it's something I'm carrying with me or, or that's you know a wheelchair traveling with me. Um, either of those are, are possible. You will, so you will have cases where you are, have reserved things and you know through, through, um, through seizing and they're not attached. You'll have cases where you've seized, they are attached. And alternatively you'll have cases where you haven't seized them, in which case the attachment is not an issue at all. So it only becomes an issue when you've seized it. And it provides you an extra me measure of flexibility as to whether it travels with you or not. Because otherwise it has to be found in points. Yeah, it would basically lead to more, um, you could do it without it, but it would lead to more clutter because right. you'd have to kind of direct around, whenever you direct the patient to a place, mm -hmm. you'd have to direct the doctor to the place. Right, yeah. And this allows it to just follow directly. It allows you to have the scope go with the patient without extra description of it. And the patient can move among many places and all those things follow. And okay. is it only for visual representation? So it shows that it travels with you? Well, it is, it is visual, but it's not just visual. So even if, if we didn't want a visual representation, it, it, it may be important, for example, that the scope travels with you to the procedure room because then it's used in the procedure room to examine you. Yeah, you see where it's where it's used <coughs> and so on. Um, okay, um, okay. So uh, I'd like to look now at. Um, well, we can do it right here. Net, let's look at network C's. Let's see how network C's works. Okay, so in in this um, main phase two. Uh, network seize is going to seize one thing. It's going to seize a procedure room. Okay? Um, and you notice it says list of resources um, there next to it. It's actually a list of resource pools that, that you're listing here. So the things are curly brackets. By the way, what are those curly brackets? Who knows what that is there? It's a bit of Java code. Like it's an array. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an, it's an array there that's, that's uh, being defined. Um, Okay, so there's um, a, um, a list of resources here, which is just Procrum. Um, and actually, if we were to go over to main phase three, and you're welcome to do that or not as you see fit, um, what you'll notice there is that we're actually going to be seizing three different pools of resources, a Procrum, a doctor, and a scope. And what that's saying is we're reserving one from each. So we need a Procrum, we need a doctor, and we need a scope. And we are going to block, um, so this is seizing, okay, this is important. This is seizing one resource from each pool. One resource may be seized while waiting for the others. So I may be associated with reserve this procedure room that's under my name, reserve the doctor, but if the scope's not available, I'm going to keep that reservation for each of those other two until I get that scope. If I want to do them sequentially, then I could sort of say, okay, first you need the doc, and only then can you proceed to the others. Um, so these are the resource pools with which the entity is seeking association. Again, this is all about being reserving, as it were, these resources for the entity, okay? Now there's something else, though, that you may have noticed in, in main phase two, which is there's, there's this queue capacity. Queue capacity specifies basically 
How many people can be waiting here to seize these resources? Because if something's not available, if this procedure is not available right now, you're not going to be able to seize it. Um, and you're going to have to wait. Someone else is using it, so you're going to have to wait for some procedure room. By the way, this is, again, it's a pool, so it could be any of the procedure rooms, okay? Um, uh, maybe just to make this more concrete, um, I, will, uh, I will run this. Um, if, in case any of you want to do it, if you go down to the simulation and you pull down, you're going to have to switch between these. You're going to have to pull down the main object class, the root, and select main phase two here, okay? Um, and uh, that's in the simulation. And then you should be able to run it. And just to make this concrete so you can see it on the screen, um, this is main phase two. And if I speed this up, what I'm going to have is here's a person. They come in. And so they've, uh, this person sees this room. They came in. And we have people sort of coming in and going to these procedure rooms. So they're entering and they're seizing a, uh, they're entering here, they're seizing rooms, and then they're leaving. And sometimes there's a fair number of these people that, that may be awaiting in the, uh, in the entry hall. Um, sometimes there's, there's few of them. If we wanted to have more people, if we wanted them to come in sooner, how would we do that based on what we've seen already? Source. So let's go to the source. And right now it's 0.05. So let's bump it up to 0.2, something like that. They come in four times as fast, right? And now we could run it again, and they're coming in quite a bit faster. And they're going to be, once again, queuing up. So I'm going to speed this up. And so you'll notice some of them are waiting now in that entry hall. Why are they waiting there? Why are these folks waiting? Yeah, the proc rooms are not yet available. And you'll notice that the entry hall is becoming rather more crowded. Why do you think that is? They're arriving faster than they're leaving. The inflow is greater than the outflow. And and uh, it, so it ran out of capacity for them. Sorry? That's the queue of 100. Uh, the queue of 100 is wait, awaiting this network seize, okay? Um, so, so that 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 is a queue capacity of 100. 100 can be waiting in line for the proc room, and that yes, they're in the waiting room until that point. So what happens if you go over that 100? Well, um, so there are ways to have um, balking for queues. So so in other words, once it reaches more than a certain level, you can um, have an individual balk out. So in other words, they they say I'm out of here. Um, you know, it's too crowded. I'm I'm going back home. And um, I think maybe some of us have experienced that with emergency rooms and so on. <laughs> and, you know, you're wondering if if you have something wrong with your arm, but the people around you are coughing so much, you figure this <laughs> you're probably worse off waiting than 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 having it looked at. Um, so uh, there are ways to, um, to to allow for for balking, um, and by default, uh, if unless you you specify some some alternative, um, it will basically say, okay, at some point, um, you know, you're, you it, it's not able to process it. So you have to put in some logic. Um, well, it it crashes in the sense that it gives a defined message saying that it couldn't couldn't uh, accomplish the flow. Yeah. Um, okay, so in fact we just saw that. So, um, yeah. Maybe I missed it. So, there's somewhere in here you define that the capacity of the proc room yeah. uh, array is three. Yes. And so where, yes. where was that defined? Uh, that is uh, going to be the subject of the um, uh, sort of, okay, so there's two components to that. I'll, I'll give you the short answer and then I'll give you the long answer. The short answer is if you if you go down to the proc room in this network, right? Um, uh, there's a um, thing here that says home defined by, and it says home path. Okay. Um, now that actually is associated with the capacity. So you see up here where it says capacity defined by, it's saying defined by the home shape. Okay. 
So it's actually defined visually by this little line that's here. Okay, you'll notice this is called room's location, and it's the number of vertices in that line. The locations of those vertices define what those rooms are. And you'll notice it says home path is room's location, and that indeed is what defines the, the capacity, okay? So if you add more, what you do is you'd stretch that line with more vertices over a larger set of rooms. And one of the nice features of that is that it simultaneously defines where the rooms are, like what, what visual representations the rooms have, and how many there are and it keeps them consistent so that you don't have one specified one place, one specified another place, okay? Um, good question, we're coming back to that whole visual representation later, okay? I'm, I'm trying to keep it a little bit um, focused on the logical side now. Okay, so, so folks, we have a, moving back to this, we had a network seize and then we have a network release, okay? And, and basically, the network release here says release all seized resources. And it further says, okay, for a moving resource, like a dock, a nurse, or what have you, what do they do? Do they stay where they are, or do they return to their home location? So you start to get the sense that resources have homes. Static resources have one home, and that's all they remain. The MRI never moves. Nur um, doctors and nurses have, have homes. Scopes and, and portable things have homes as well, okay? So um, what I'm saying is there's network release. Okay, now we've talked about network uh, network seize and network release. So seizing a resource, releasing a resource. Um, those are releasing reservations between an entity and a resource, a unique reservation. The fact that one entity has it means no other entity can have it. Only one entity can be in reservation of a cock room at the same time. Only one entity can be attended by a doctor at one time. Only one entity can be associated with a scope at one time. Okay. Um, we're now going to start exploring this a little bit more. We're going to examine something called network send to. Okay. Um, this is about taking a resource that's already been seized and sending it to some place. Okay. Um, so it's um, it's sending it to uh, either a excuse me, um, either a resource um, or to a, an entity or to some fixed place. So let's go look at that. Um, so there's network, okay, so network send to, um, yeah, it's, we all have to go to number three, that's right. Uh, so uh, let's go. Um, so, uh, so there's um, the send to storage. So here, what we're going to have is um, we're going to be sending a resource, which resource? The doctor, to, to a, another seized resource unit, which is the scope. So the doctor is seized by the patient. They've been reserved by the patient. And they're going to go pick up another, the, the, an item from another pool from the scope pool that has been seized by that same entity, and they're going to go go fetch it, okay? Um, and and that's that's specified in in these two pieces here. So the doctor is going to fetch the scope. Both of them have, have been seized. You'll notice, by the way, that that occurs after network seize because it, it's dependent on them having seized it, okay? Um, so. Um, uh, you can, in fact, use uh, this network send to, in some cases, to move several things. So, for example, if you look at the next one, send to patient, what's going on here is that the seized resources, the doctor and now the scope that the doctor retrieved, are going to be moving to the entity. See that? So before, they moved to the, seized, the doctor moved to the seized resource unit, to the to scope. And now both of them are moving to the entity, to the entity that, with which they're associated. So in short, the seizing associated the patient, the entity, with the doc, the scope, the procedure room. We sent the doc to get the scope, 
associated, both associated with the same entity. Having, having reached that, the doctor and the scope make their way to the entity. The doctor, the scope can do that because it's with a, a moving resource. So the doc can carry it. It's a portable resource. Um, you couldn't carry an MRI, for example. So um, there, we've we've sent it to the to the patient. Okay, um, to the entity. Okay. So the next step here is network attach, and what this is focused on is associating with entity with the C's resources. When I say associating, it's really attaching it. It's, it's physically being in, in um, possession of it or in, in, in accompanied by it, okay? So here, this network attach, we have the entity being attached to all non-static resources that are located with the entity, okay? So all these resources that are with the patient are now attached to them. Now, there's an important resource that's not with the patient. So, let's, let's be clear here. The patient entered, the, ent the entity entered, right? The entity sees what resources here? Dr. Proctor and the scope. The doctor was sent to fetch the scope for the same patient. The, the C's doctor for that patient was sent to get the C's scope for that patient. Both of them were then sent to the patient to the location of the entity. When they get there, they are then attached to this entity. It, it, they sort of are now in physical, sort of it's physically going to travel with this entity. And then the entity is going to move to the procedure room. Why wasn't the procedure room attached to them here? Why wasn't the procedure room carried with them? Yeah, first of all, it's fixed. It, it's a static resource, so it wouldn't be applied here in the first place. And the second thing is it's not at their location. It's, it's, it's still, they haven't gone to there yet. The doc, they seized these things. The doc went to get the scope. The doc and the scope came to the patient. They're in presence of the patient. The patient has attached to them. And they're all about to say, let's go. And where are they going to go? They're going to go to the prop room. Okay. Um, so yeah. No, so no. Um, so let, let's let's think about that. It's a great question. So, folks, suppose so this network sees. I'm seizing the doctor. I'm seizing the scope, and I'm seizing the proc room. That may take a while, right? Because right. the proc rooms may not be free. I may have to wait for a bit, right? And so on. The, do the, the doctor may not be free, so on. And then once I get those things, the doc has to go get the scope. How quickly is the doc going to get the scope? What's going to determine that? His speed and the path, the particulars of the path he follows, which just in a sneak preview is determined by this path here. So just to sort of give us some sense here, I'd like to go down to the simulation and, and select to run main phase three, okay? And, and let's run this just, to, just so that we have a visual kind of idea of what's going on. Okay, so so let's let's get a patient in there. Okay, okay. So what's going on here? Okay, doctor is going to the patient. They attach to it, and they're going to the proc room, right? <laughs> um. Okay, so so that okay. So here's a patient. His doc is going, or her doc is going over there, getting that scope going around, and it looks like they're going on some pretty predetermined lines, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. They're not exerting a lot of behavioral flexibility <laughs> as, to their, uh, as to their paths through, their, through the facility. Um, and indeed, that's all defined. It's all predetermined in a sort of um, uh, you know, uh, fixed, fixed way. Um, oh, okay, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, so, so well, you could you could define different um, different lines. Let's um, let's let's uh, start that again, just so we we're very clear about. Um, so let's let's try to get one patient in. Um, come on. Um, 
Okay, there we go. Okay, so the dock is coming out, right? Um, the dock is, is uh, they've entered, okay, you'll notice here, this is indicating the number of entities that have flown, uh, flowed, flown up, <laughs> flowed down here. So there was one that was waiting for send to storage. Now it's done. So now it's getting, it's being processing send to patient for the first one. See that one there? It's, that, that means it's kind of, it's entered here, but it's not yet done. And it's proceeding at a stately pace. And that stately pace is defined by the speed of the dock. It's defined by the speed of the dock. So you notice now the second one is in that same phase. So hence the two here. And watch this. This is going to increment to one, as now this they've they've done the network attach, and now they're moving to the proc room. See that? So so they're moving down to the proc room with with that scope and so on. Um, and so, you know, this is going to allow you to um, keep track. And you notice there's a number up at the top here, which is the number that are where it's currently in progress. So this procedure is in progress for this one here. And in the fullness of time, it's finished, and they get detached, and the uh, doc and the scope are going to go back, and, and, and the patient is, um, is eventually going to be released. Um, so, so that's what's playing out in this process. And so that associated the entity with the resources, they're attaching to the patient while the patient's where? Where is the patient? S still in the... Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the entry hall. It's where they came in. They haven't moved. That patient hasn't moved yet. They seize these things remotely, which is a scary thought. Um, but they, they, skis, they seize them from the, the entry hall. And then all these, the dock and the scope came to them. They got attached, and they're moving to the procedure room, which was already seized. And then they have the procedure and then they're going to detach from them, okay? So let's, let's continue on our sort of progression through this. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, yes, I believe that, uh, yes, because the move to exit is later. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yes, you could. Um, how would you do it in parallel based on something I said earlier? It, yeah, you could have the fork, you could split, and you could have the patient taking off while the things are being returned. Yeah. Um, okay, so network move to, what we have going on here, move to proc room, basically what, what's going on here is that this is defining, move to is defining for the agent, or for the entity, I should say, um, they are moving, and the destination is the seized resource unit associated with the proc room. And implied in this, implicit in this, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that they are traveling with all things that have been attached to them. Right? That's why we attach these things. And what things have been attached to them? Scope and the dock or attached to them here. So wherever that patient goes, the scope and the dock will follow. And and here they're going to a seized resource unit. By the way, this is the name for a what? Is this a particular procedure room? It, I mean, it, it, like proc, proc room, what is that actually labeling? It's labeling a, it's a, yeah, it's a set, it's a pool. Um, and, but what's implicit here is that it's the seized one of that pool. The seized one of that pool that they seized, they're, they're going to it now, okay? Um, and because the resources are seized, this, this will move the entity, but also bring the portable resources along, the moving and portable resources. The dock can go along because he's moving. The scope can go along because it is portable, portable, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what dictates the time? What dictates the time is the speed. Uh, like the physical speed. The physical speed. Okay. The physical speed. So, so docks can move at a certain speed, and there's a certain length of each of these paths. 
do doctors take a certain amount of time to go from their home location to get the scope? And then once they've gotten the scope, they're sent to the patient with the scope, and that takes a certain amount of time to go there. Once they get the patient, they go to the proc room, and all those things are dictated by speed. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. That allows you to capture the effect of the poor layout. Yes. And how quickly it's processed. Precisely. Precisely. So it's an emergent property of the paths and the speed. And in fact, you could have people speed. Remember, folks, those are numbers like 10 right now. You could have that speed vary dynamically by how tired they are, by how congested, how many patients are there, by you know the the uh, character of the patient, how serious their condition is, or whatever. You could have have the speeds vary, and then they have to traverse a certain a certain distance, and so it's as an emergent property, it's going to be how how long does it take them. And that's going to then interact with the scheduling, right? Because they're going to need to schedule rooms, and they've got this room reserved, but if it's going to take them a while to get there, they're going to have it overall reserved for a longer period of time, which is going to then, you know, uh, start interacting with the scheduling of reservation by other people, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting way of capturing a lot of these effects. Yeah. So Well, it's, it's a great question. I think, I think you know, you would need to ask yourself what exactly are the, you know, what are plausibly the major drivers for, um, for the, the concerns I have or the, re the research question I have or the problem I'm trying to, to characterize. You know, if, if what you're dealing with is inherently something that involves crowding, um, waiting times, um, and you're trying to articulate questions like, should we add another, um, uh, another set of, of rooms for you know, our students to meet patients in, for our, for our residents you know, to examine patients? Would that speed up our, our operations? Um, then that would start to alert you to the importance of waiting times and speeds and so on, and, and facility layout issues. And something like this would become more uh, more directly relevant. On the other hand, if your questions are, are quite far removed from that, and it's not clear that they, they really are seriously, seriously impacted by the, the physical layout of the facility, by the, um, the particulars, the vagaries of the speed with which you know, things are, are carried delivered, and then it's more an issue of, um, of sort of maybe patient internal state and misjudgment of that state or lack of expertise, then you know this this really, as you say, it might it it might characterize all sorts of details, but the details are not going to inform your real challenge. But you know this is the primary question in many ways with agent-based modeling and with this sort of modeling, particularly in combination, because we have such flexibility. We can go to town if we want, describe everything from hair color to, you know, um, sort of the music, preferred music choices and so on. But, but that, that is an opportunity cost. It takes us away from doing other things. It, it distracts us and it, um, it takes our time away from time we could be spending asking, you know, uh, investigating more relevant things. And um, I think always for me, you know, it, it's coming back to, what are your dynamic hypotheses? What are your hypotheses about what plausibly is contributing in a major way to your issue of concern and what things therefore might you want to examine as changing? You know, if you're examining like interventions, um, uh, what things might be under your control to change and or uh, you know, might you want to examine the effects of changes because they're not under your control in the future and you might be subject to external um, buffeting uh, with respect to those things. So, so really it has to do, I think, with your understanding of, <coughs> of the salient features of the system vis-a-vis -vis your research question. And this is one more yeah. Well, I would...
would say, okay, so you're saying improve. Yeah. So, so relative to what? What do you see as the, you, you're, you're clearly concerned that, that um, you know, it's not adequate now. What are the major symptoms of that inadequacy? What are the major points that cause you great concern right now? Now, some of those might be our, our patient population is fed up with, with waiting times and, you know, they are balking and going home rather than sticking for care and it leads to a lot of untreated illnesses. And that might alert me immediately. There might be something else though, which is that, you know, we have real high spreads of nosocomial infection in our hospitals and, and there it's not so clear, like, could this be affected by waiting times by the fact that, you know, you've got so many patients stacked up in the hallways that you're having a, a very easy conduit for infection. So might it involve health service delivery efficiency issues or might it not? It's not so clear and you'd have to, you'd have to you know, learn more about the environment. For example, is this issue affecting hospitals that are, are less crowded, you know, for example, more recently built? Is it, is it a more general phenomenon which could be plausibly divorced from the issue of efficiency? That, that's right, that's right. I mean, and I think often the people you're talking with will have some at least pet guesses for what's going on, right? They'll say, I think the major problem is X, Y, or Z, and, you know, um, um, and sometimes you get real clear indications if you're barking up the wrong tree. They'll say, look, that's a third order issue, you know. We could tell you all you want about doctors scheduling algorithms and so on, but, but really that's not the issue. Um, could be cut, and maybe they'll say, you know, look back three years, you had a totally different scheduling algorithm, we still have the same problems, you know, so they'll have like points of reference to, to clue, clue themselves in as to what plausibly is a driving factor in the problems they're trying to investigate, right? Um, so, and, and suffice it to say, like this sort of, of modeling that I'm showing here, um, I do a tremendous amount of models that, that have no touch of this, no, no touch of it. I have some other models where this is more central because people ask, you know, um, uh, what is the effect of a change in facility layout? What's the effect of a change in the, the number of increased beds <laughs> or, or the, um, an increase in the, in the number of rooms available for, for clinical use or what have you? And, and that seems very obviously something here. Or, you know, people will talk about if we move this resource from this wing of the hospital to that one, how will it impact our patient throughput or something like that? And this seems to be obviously relevant. And then there's some things in the middle where mm, you're going to have to really exercise judgment and use best guesses and start simple, you know, and, uh, and see if you can explain salient patterns without recourse to this. You know, um, great, great question, and I, I like how you linked it into the high-level issues. Um, okay, so so following a procedure, we have a network detach, and that deta that unreserves all the resources from that patient, um, from that entity. So the entity, excuse me, entity is physically separated. So so um, they're associated with them, they still have them reserved, but they're physically um, dissociated. And then there's a release that, that unreserves them, that says, okay, you know, um, uh, you are now, uh, you, know, you, you can now be used by other patients. So if there's another patient, like right away, who requires a doc, maybe the doc will go from this room um, in which they're located um, with, with the existing patient and they'll perhaps go directly to, to the new patient. I mean, so watch this. Okay, so this patient comes down here and um, what you may see is, okay, actually so the doc here, this is interesting, the doc here has to return the scope uh, before they are released. So that actually limits the flexibility. You could imagine a situation where Instead of doing that, you, you can instead release them um, first and then they could actually directly go to another patient, right? Um, this kind of serializes it in, in another way. Um, okay, so um, 
So here, with the network release, the moving resource, the dock, returns to the home location after resource, after release from being reserved. And associated with this release, you'll notice it says um, here, releases all seized resources. So the patient releases the dock room, the dock, and the scope, and then moving resources return to the home location. It already returned the scope, so the dock already did that. After the dock returns the scope, where is the dock? In the scope room. Um, so, so if, if you really watch carefully here, um, let's let's sort of uh, slow it down. Um, uh, okay, so here here comes the dock. They're getting the scope. Um, they sent to scourge. Now they're being sent to the patient. They are being attached to the patient. They went down. Um, they're currently attached. They're under the procedure, and now the doc is is going back. They're they, okay. Just got released, and now the doc is going back directly from the scope room. Um, that's where they were. What is it that allowed that doctor to to go back to the, return the scope like that? The fact that it was detached. The fact that it no longer was physically attached to the to the entity. Why the goes from the scope room to the, uh, so, sorry? Why why the doctor goes after returning the scope? Why he goes back to the doctor's room? Well, okay. Why does he go back to the doctor's room? He goes back to the doctor's room because of this thing here. Um he is so he has been detached He's been sent to the scope room with this return. I guess well, I don't have a. Uh, this return scope thing is basically this is a network send to. And send to is compared to move to. <laughs> send to sends a resource. So here the, the doctor and the scope are being sent to a specified node, the storage room. And they, are they still associated with the patient? Are they still reserved by, with the patient at this point? Yeah, they're still reserved by the patient. Then they get released here, um, and the moving resource returns to their home location. The reason they could do this is because they were detached. They no longer had to sit by the patient. And then the patient can move to the exit. But if you, if you, yeah. if you release them before... Uh, okay, before so if you release them then what would happen is they would no longer be associated with the patient. And then they would be sent to home location. Um, you could, okay, so it, it's more complicated than that because uh, the doctor knows to carry the scope because it's the scope associated with that patient. Yeah. And so you would have to, you'd have to figure out how to sort of have them still carry the scope even though it's no longer associated with the patient. And I'd have to think about how that would get done. There should be a way to do it, but uh, I'd have to think so much about um, how to describe it. Okay, so here the doc went back to their home location after returning the scope. Okay, so what I've just described is the logical steps of the logical operators, the logical sort of pieces that you use to build these models. My thought was now to describe the visual depiction. I mean, how does this all work together with this visual depiction? And it's not merely a matter of how it how the logical thing appears. It's actually the visual depiction is used to define some things. We saw one thing of that already. We saw that that this line, innocuous though it seemed, this arbitrary line on the screen, it actually defined what the procedure rooms are. And so there's some of this definition that's tied up with the um, visual depiction. Okay, so when we have a visual depiction of what's going on, entities are associated with icons. These patients, in this case, are associated with icons. Resources are associated with locations and icons. Locations, a home location. Icons, a depiction of the visual. Movement networks are associated with routing paths behind the scenes. Movement networks are shown visually when, in the, when you're designing the model, they're invisible when you're running it. So those movement paths disappear when you're running it. Um, and here we're moving resources among different visual locations. Um, uh, so resources are being moved to specific
specific points or points associated with some resources like a prop room or what have you. So these, these entities and these resources are moving visually uh, on the screen. So let's go look at this. Um, okay, there's two things, two separate things. And I mentioned send to only briefly, but uh, I have a slide which mentions this. Okay, so when you're moving an entity along with any attached thing, you're using network move to. That moves an entity. Network send to is to send a resource. Who gets sent? Who got sent in this mod? Well, when do we have a move to? When do we have this? When do we move the entity anywhere? Mm -hmm. Everyone turned to the prop room. And at the end, they went to the exit. Yeah, so if, if we go to the model here, um, a move to exit is a network move to. If we went to... Um, uh, move to proc room, it's a network move to. Hmm? Network send to is about moving a mobile resource. Where do we see that in this model? Where do we have to have a resource go somewhere? Got the scope. Got the scope. So send to storage. The doctor, this is network send to, got sent to the storage, right? It got sent to, in fact, the seized scope, right? Where else do we have it sent to? Sorry? Yeah, the returning of the scope. Returned of the scope network sent to. So that's about a resource being sent to a location. Um, I know this is uh, an awful lot for a late Friday um, <laughs> before a long weekend. I was just wondering, is that a language of any logic, or is it a um, common language for this type of type of simulations? It, it's, so it's particular, um, there's some things that are unique to any logic, but a lot of the term, the basic terminology of seizing, for example, and attaching and so on, uh, it's used by some other packages as well. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know, with, like with Arena, it uses some of the same same terminology as well. Right? I mean, it for certain things. It uses a lot of the same terminology, yeah. but it's not, as, it's not as focused on the um, picture. No, the so we, we, you use the visualization a lot to find what the resources are doing, where they are, what their capacity is, things like that. <laughs> While in Arena, you might have, have a picture at all. Right? You, okay. just, you would just have that graph, uh, the, the line there. So let's let's talk some about this issue of, of uh, visualization, though, and how it maps to this. So the first thing I wanted to focus on was actually the earlier question, um, uh, or, or was presaged by the earlier question. So if we go over to main phase three, and we go click on that um, that red line uh, over there, there's a polyline known as rooms location. Um, so that's its name is rooms location. And it seems an innocuous and uh, not particularly privileged polyline. But if you go down to network uh, and specifically to proc room, what you'll find is that the proc room uh, has its, has its uh, home path, as the home, so-called home path, uh, rooms location. Its home is defined by a path across nodes. And the capacity is defined by that home shape. This is packing a lot into this. The path across the nodes is defining what nodes uh, define each of the proc rooms in turn. So proc room one, you'll, you'll see if you click on it, this is, oh, this is all part of a network group, but it's called proc room one. This is proc room two, and this is proc room three. 
And the fact that this spans them is identifying them to the um, to the to the any logic software as being uh, sort of resources, the visual representation of the resources. Um, and uh, the uh, the fact that these are are listed here, if you go up to network here, um, what you'll see is that it says group of network shapes are network group. Okay, um, and you'll notice further there's some things having to do with the visual semantics specified here that I glossed over before. So when an item is at a node, think an entity in the waiting room, for example, it appears at a random position within the node or at the top left corner or in the center of the node. So you'll remember that when we, in, when we increased the, the arrival rate of individuals, do you remember what happened? We increased it from 0.05 to like 0.2. And do you remember where those individuals were being placed? Yeah, they were being placed randomly. So we could speed this up here. But you could see them appearing at sort of random places here as their population swells. Um, and, and so that was, that was all dictated by that, by that parameter. Another, another network option would have been in the top left corner in which case they would all be squeezed into that upper left corner. There's many, many of them there. There's, there's you know, 37, 43, 50. It's, it's, it's rising rapidly. And they're all squeezed up in that upper corner. So, so that's, a, um, that's a setting with uh, implications for how these things appear. I will uh, change it again to random position within the node. Um, so this network group, you'll notice over here on the left hand side, there's a thing called network group here. That groups together all of these. Um, it's sort of one way of sort of uh, gathering together all of these things. And if you want, you can go into the particulars within this, but this this is sort of the little visual world associated with this network. That's what that's saying. Okay. Um, so uh, that's one aspect of, of the visual component. Um, so the network knows about these different components that are within that network group. Um, uh, okay, so presentation of entity. Let's go look at this. If we look at the source here, Okay, so what do what do entities have to do with waiting halls? Um, so uh, that's that's the question. Okay, so um, so first of all, where, why do we think that an entity has something to do with a waiting hall? Good, good. So they appear there. So that's exactly right. So where would that be specified? I would venture that that would be specified in one place of the model. Let's see if you can guess where it is. Network enter, yeah. Um, network, it's, it's associated with the network. The network is what knows about all these different places in this network group. Let's go look at network enter. And, oops, um, and if you go look at network enter, it says entry node is waiting hall, okay? Um, and you'll notice, by the way, this is dynamic. Um, and uh, you could, in fact, uh, have it where they appear depend on properties of the person. So you notice it says use self to name the entity here. That's what that little thing says. So maybe different entities you want them to start in different places. Maybe maybe the um, VIP patients appear, you know, in the in the in the boardroom or something like that, um, or at the special waiting hall. And um, and uh, so you could have. You could have different patients appear in different places. Uh, waiting hall here is, is just one thing, but it could be a Java expression. It could be a random thing that you know randomly places them in different places uh, as they come in through through so different we entrances. Saying, let's say that VIP status to a person on a random basis. Well, yeah, you could in fact do that, um, and there's a couple ways you could do it. I mean, if if you only had a one-off sort of thing that. All it depends is where they appear. Then you can just have it be a random thing here, and with a certain probability they appear at the waiting hall or they appear at the VIP place. 
And is there a variable or parameter that they could specify when the entity is being entered, uh, when not being the entry in the system? Uh, work, then I would say that there is a parameter that would use a random truth or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you could. So, 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 so yeah. So, in other words, um, could you remember, like, for an entity, mm -hmm. some persistent attribute, yes. like, oh, they're a VIP, and so maybe they get a quicker procedure being done on them, right? Uh, or maybe they get charged more or whatever, <laughs> um, right? Uh, so, uh, yes, you could do that. And um, I have a slide later which comments on one way of doing that, okay? So, uh, so we'll, get, we'll get to that. But there, there is a way of doing that. And, in fact, that's exactly the way we'd use to associate them with an object or with an agent, okay? Um, okay, so uh, enemy entity animation shape here uh, is specified for the source. That specifies the shape of the, the, to use for patient. So if you look, there's a thing called shape patient. And shape patient is, where is shape patient? I think it's, there it is, shape doctor, shape patient. Yeah, um, right, exactly. Um, so um, uh, here we have a, um, an individual who's got uh, a shape, uh, and that's one of, a number of built-in any logic shapes, I believe. So if we were to go and look at the palette, um, and you were to go look at, um, I can't remember if it's in presentation or if it's in um, uh, in uh, pictures. It's it. Ah, here we go. Yeah. So you know maybe we want to change it so that uh, they use this patient, right? Okay, um, so uh, this is called patient, and um, so where do we go to associate this? Who remembers what were we were just looking at? Or it's source. Uh, no, it's actually uh, the source. Yes, I thought you said resource. Sorry, source. Yes. Um, uh, okay, so uh, in the source, we scroll down. Instead of shape patient, we say patient. Um, sorry. Oh, the pictures were in um, in uh, photos, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, um, and and then you can you could run this, and uh, they would then have a different appearance associated with that alternative icon. Um, and uh, and there we go. <laughs> they don't look not look quite as 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 flexible as before. Um, but um, yeah. Um, let's suppose I wanted it to have two different. So, so suppose we wanted patients of two different sorts. So we wanted two different types of icons. Maybe we we wanted. Uh, uh, yeah, or, or maybe um, maybe we want that patient, and we wanted um, shape patient for the other one. So so two of them. Do you think we could put a how would we do that? We've seen it before, this sort of thing. How do we do that? How do we do? Okay, that that would be one way. But actually, we could do random true. Um, 0.5 probability. If it's true, we have it be patient. Otherwise, we have it be shape patient. Shape patient, right? Um, and and so we could have this uh, go ahead and. Um, but that, that assigns a different picture, but actually the property of the page itself is going to be the same. So, so say if that. If you wanted later on to distinguish between, the, let's say, a female patient would have to see a certain type of doctor right. versus a male patient. Correct. Yeah. So, so that that was the question there, and the answer is yes, you can. And I'll um, I'll comment on how one would do that in um, it'll probably be in another ten minutes or something. Okay. Um, um, okay. So we're actually most of the way uh, through this. Um, uh, okay. So there's there's further pictures associated with resources, right? 
So uh, pictures associated with patients, pictures with the entities, in other words, pictures associated with resources. So um, where would you expect those to be found? Where would we look for properties of a resource? Resource pool, where the resource pool is defined. So let's, let's go down and look under docs, because they have the most, um, most clear sort of uh, representation. And there's a thing you'll notice that says shape doctor. And you'll notice it's different for idle and busy. So, you know, you could have them change into um, so, some other shape um, when they're busy. Um, um, well, we have limited choices here. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, we'll have them change. When they're busy, they'll be a fighter jet. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Come on. Uh, fighter. No. Okay. Uh, fighter. Is it fighter? Is it fighter? No, it's fighter. Fighter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, we'll say fight. Okay. First of all, let's see if it compiles. I mean, uh, no. Fighter cannot be resolved. Um, is it? Oh, you know what? I didn't drag it in. I have to. I have to put it in the model, right? Um, so let's let's uh, let's put it in there, okay. It, and it's called fighter now. Okay. okay. Now we can, yeah. I mean, it just define it from the palette. You have to drag it and add it. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Oh, is It's not random true. Um, the, the random true. I'll go back to in a second. But it's it's random true. It, you pass it as a parameter of point five or point whatever. Question and then after it, question mark, you know, A colon B. Um, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so here, okay. <laughs> so there's, there, there's a doctor coming with all their might and power. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's picked up the scope pretty well there. Um, <laughs> Now it's going to go. <laughs> the patient may be surprised, um, <laughs> but maybe that's what VIPs get. Um, they they get the care from the fighter jet, um, and and so we'll have it go pick up. But <laughs> no, that's the wingman. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. That is a good question. Um, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, sorry? I, th I think you can import bitmaps. I think you can import bitmaps um, as, as, uh, as images <laughs> to use in the models. Um, so um, we're, we're having quite a dogfight there. So <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's close it off. Um, but uh, as you can see, it, it does afford you flexibility with the visual representation. And it's actually not that hard to do. Um, uh, send me a mail about that. I, I, I'd like to get an answer to that, and I'll, I'll see if I can let the class know. Um, I've got that and the um, reading in the static networks I want to do in the next week, um, reading in a network from a p file and using it dynamically. OK. so. Um, You'll notice here that uh, the resource, moreover, has a home node. A node, a node in the visual location that it calls home. And a doctor's home is where? It's in the staff room here. So it's in, it's in a particular location here. It's called staff room, OK? And that's within that presentation group. Um, and well, we saw that the patients um, uh, enter uh, uh, enter uh, at network enter if they're assigned to speed, right? Um, and we could have uh, just as as we've done. You can imagine the random true thing. You could have some patients with one speed, some patients with another speed, or or some such. Um, and the movement network, most perhaps most puzzlingly, is defined by polygons and rectangles here. So. Um, Over time. I believe that you can, yes. Um, I, I, will, I will have to double check that, but I believe the answer is yes. Um, uh, I think you might have to do it. So, so I, you notice it says D here, right? 
Well, here, let's, let, let's do an experiment, folks. If, if you want to figure out, you know, can you do it? Let's have the speed be set by one plus the current time. Right? Okay, so, so as time goes on, things should be what? Faster and faster. Okay, so let's let's just see if it changes. I, I don't know if it will through this. There might be a more complicated way you have to do, say, call call set change. Okay, so um, so it's looking to me like there's not a lot of obvious speed up here. Um, I think it wasn't doing clusters with the deprecation. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, so there's a. There's actually a confounding factor here, though, that we're not we're not correctly anticipating because there's two speeds of relevance. There's there's a limiting there are two limiting speeds. What are the two limiting speeds? When well, let's suppose when the fighter jet picks up the patient. The the, yeah, the patient can only go so fast, uh, and then the fighter jet can go so fast. Um, so so um, so here we we actually want the what is network end or specifying? That's the speed for whom. Yeah, that's the entities. That's the patients coming in. If we want to set the speeds associated with docs, they would be set in the doctor pool, right? Um, so, so uh, here you, you'll see the speed. Now, note note that that has no d next to it. So I'm wondering if let, let's set that to a very large speed. I'm going to set it to a speed of a th of a thousand, um, as as be better so chat. Um, and um, let's let's just see what. Okay, so, um, so that one looks like it's it's cruising a little bit faster. I think the patients that came in later are are enjoying a faster a faster service. Um, yeah. So, so notice it was. <laughs> It was it was when they came in that's dictating it because yeah. that that gave them their speed at that and the first one didn't do such a at the time. Speed. There's still the open question though of of whether the, a given patient's speed will be increasing over time, and I don't believe we have evidence that it is. I think it's actually when they came in dictates their speed subsequently, but I'd have to check that. Yeah. But I just wondering if there is any sequence of events that you can analyze and decide whether the entity should move faster from this moment on or right. Yeah, I mean one th here. I'll, okay, Look, this is, these are good questions. Let me let me just tell. Here's another way that's going to clue you at. Okay, watch this. Um, I'm thinking about how much mechanism this this defines. Okay, just bear with me, folks, for a second here. This is just one aspect of of kind of uh, debugging and orienting yourself. Okay, so what I want is I want a general. I'm going to create a function. Okay. This function is going to do. It's going to be called. Hey, come on! I meant to. I have to drag it. Um, function. I'm going to. I'm going to call it get speed. Okay. Hmm? Okay. Watch this. Get speed. Okay. So I created a function called get speed, and it's going to return what to return a speed. It's going to return a double. Okay. Now. I could just have it be return ten, right? I could do that, and then when they enter, it will return ten, right? Um, so I could do, okay. So it will be uh, get speed, um, get speed. I'm going to call get speed, right? And I could run it right now. Um, yes, I could have said this get speed actually, and I, I should have done that to be clear, but. Um, here it's calling this dot get speed, okay? Um, actually, this here, um, in, in this context, it within the current context, this is referring to main because this lives in main, okay? So, so this this is all within a main class called main I phase three. Uh, well, yeah, all these things, this whole flowchart lives in main, and so it, 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 this refers to, it's something referring to main. And so I can call get this stuck at speed, but watch this. One thing I could do is say, um, in addition, because it's a function, I could say, you know, trace ln um, uh, get speed was called at time, you know, time, right? Um, 
and watch this and then I'm further going to do it so so I only have one I only have patients coming in really infrequently okay I'm going to make it come in 0 0.01 so now what's going to happen is that um, uh, it's going to tell me whenever get speed is called okay now has get speed been called yet no not yet let's let's speed this up um, okay okay there there it was okay it only called it ever once and that's when that patient came in this this patient called that in um, so in short it's telling me whenever it's it needs it, it's calling that thing whenever it's setting the speed and it looks like it's only when the agents actually appear the entities actually appear within the simulation that it, that it actually is doing that so if you wanted to speed up I believe there's a way to do it but you probably what you'd have to do is you'd have to tell the entity hey speed up by sending in a message by, by calling a method on it okay but uh, that is a good question um, and I, I'd like to know uh, I'd have to investigate that um, um, okay so um, let, me, let me just see one more thing uh, here but yeah a question Yeah, yeah. Well, moreover, though, you can even do better than that in the sense that you can, um, so, so you could have a history, like a history, um, a whole record of history formally saved away, uh, you know, in in each agent by itself, and then you put it to a database, or you, you know, at the end, you 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 dump it down or whatever. And so, I actually, some of the example models I handed out, I think it's it's in one of them. There's a thing that accumulates arbitrary history that you could specify for the agent, and you could just save away, you know, oh, save away this event in my history, and then later you can ask, give me your history, and, and you can get a whole sort of history for that agent as they float through. But this, this again, is getting back to this issue, can we store other information for agents? Can we make agents less faceless and instead give them attributes, give them characteristics? Um, and the answer is yes, and it's through a technique known as subclassing. Okay, um, but let's let's finish up just a couple things here. Okay, so procedure rooms were defined as being associated with the nodes hit by this home path called rooms location, and um, so the the rectangles touched by the polyline vertices are the room locations. Okay, so if I were to if I were to go like this and um, eliminate one of these things. Um, delete one of those right and if I were to then run it what would you expect to happen you would get only two. yeah I'd have only two rooms I'd have a total of two rooms and they'd be those two rooms that are still still touched so let's let's watch this yeah so so you know I, I slowed down the number of patients coming but you could see they're only going mm -hmm. that there's only two airports for the fighter jets right now um and yeah yeah it's only those those two and similarly if I wanted to extend it to others um I, I forget any logics way of doing this I think I think you you click in the middle of this um yeah double double click yeah there we go and and you can add another sort of um another thing and so now we should be back to three rooms um uh as 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 labeling this um these sets. So, so kind of slightly funky aspect of that you actually have this this labeling um, uh, of of rooms by these things. And so, yeah, there were, there we have three. Okay. So meanwhile, they're traveling on these these edges. And so, if we were to double click here, you know, um, hey, oh man. Um, so I'm not not sure why it's. Um, I was I was thinking I could add a, another um, node here. Um, there, there we go. Um, but you know, I could, I can maybe have them go to the corner there, right? Um, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm coming in more frequently here. Um, let's let's run this thing. And now they should exhibit a sort of odd, circuitous path to that final room, right? Um, uh, okay, yeah. See, see that. So th they're going via via that path, and automatically it takes into account, you know, how long that takes. 
its own aspect of, <laughs> of the sort of space space uh, travel and their speed. Okay, um, do 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 do, um, and then move to exit is moving it a person directly to a specified node. So that's a move to, because it's moving the entity, send to, remember for resource, move to for the entity, and this move to exit um, moves people to the exit node. Okay, um, And that's, that's a node as specified over here visually. So that they're moving to this exit location um, and, and then they uh, vimush. And the exit location, if you go click on it, it's this guy right here. So, um, oop, come on, there we go. Um, it's a rectangle, this exit, right? And then the exit from the network, and then the entity disappears, and its visual representation will be will be disappearing um, as it as it goes out. Okay, so. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of this right now, but I'll hope motivate a concept we're going to be covering in our Java tutorials probably in the next two weeks here. Maybe, maybe we'll prior a little bit longer than that, but uh, three weeks. But um, right now we have entities in this model, we have generic entities, and and the fact that we have generic entities is set by if you go up to this source, what you'll find is that it says new entity, it says, you know, for when, uh, when you require a new entity, you call new entity. This entity is a fairly generic thing. It has no special types of information in it. It's kind of faceless, okay? Um, we can associate with nice pictures and so on, but, but fundamentally we're not storing information right now. Now, if we want to store the information, we can readily do that. For example, history information, um, associated external agent and a corresponding external agent population, um, uh, characteristics like whether they're VIP or whether they're male or female or what have you that, that have persistent impact on their flow through the system. Those might be things we want to maintain associated with each entity. Um, correspondingly, we might want to change resources. So we have resources that store information. Maybe you want to store for each doctor how many patients they've treated. Or how much a given resource, how much a given procedure room has been used. Or how many times a given scope has come in contact with a patient. Or the most recent time it's come in contact with. Them. All sorts of things you could imagine accumulating. Either because you want it to affect model operation, or because you want to collect that information for subsequent analysis to understand kind of what's going on in the model. Um, so to do this, um, you can make use of a, a technique known as subclass. And, and basically what subclass is, is going to do is it's going to create a, a special variety of entity, but it's going to have more information than a typical entity. Okay? It in all ways is going to be an entity. It's a, it's a full 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 entity, it's just going to have some additional um, additional information uh, associated with it. Um, and uh, this additional information will allow you to, to store information of, of your desired time. Um, so uh, similarly, we can, we can have resources that will be subclasses of the normal resource, resource types, and they will also store information. Um, so um, we'll be discussing this in an upcoming Java tutorial. If you're interested in it, I have an example model which was already provided to you as part of um, those. It was under those that said, I think, for class use only or something along those lines in that examples.zip on the website and um, the Stella site, Stellar site. And uh, there's one called something like um, ABM Clinic Model version 7 or something like that. And there you'll see that entities actually have a subclass defined and, and it stores extra information. So um, I'm not going to show it right now because uh, it will lead us a little bit um, further afield, but suffice it to say, say that subclassing is, is how, you, um, how you build up these, um, uh, the 
this additional information to be carried around. And anything, the interesting thing is anything that can operate on an entity can operate on a subclass of entity. So all the code that is there in any logic to work with standard entities, generic entities can work with your more advanced entities. It's just your advanced entities will have some additional uh, features to them that you can make use of, such as history property. 